Hey guys, it's Biggs. You guys have no idea what's happening today. I got something pretty cool today. I've been invited and I'm gonna go and sit down with a true aquatic master. This guy actually makes the, the term aquatic master. This is what it's all about. So I'm pretty stoked. I think you guys are gonna be pretty stoked too. Hey guys, I told you I was gonna have a super good surprise for you today. Look who it is, Mr. Jim Cummings. Thanks for having us, Jim. You're welcome. It's awesome. Always awesome. nice to have you over. <laughs> well, today I told you guys I'm going to be visiting with an aquatic master, and uh, this guy here really truly gives meaning to the title. Uh, this guy's done it all. He's a lifelong aquarist, collector, author, world-renowned speaker. A lot of you guys know him already. He's got a great YouTube channel out there. We'll send the link to it on the, on the things. But uh, thanks for having us, Jim. Now, always. always. I know some of you guys might think it, but... Uh, you're in fact not the voice of Winnie the Pooh, right? I am not the voice of Winnie yeah. the Pooh. If so you just ever do clear that search, up. if you do a search for me, uh, um, to get the YouTube uh, channel that I have, and you enter Jim Cumming, you will get Jim Cumming, the voice actor of Winnie the Pooh. Now I'm proud to be associated with that, but you have to keep looking a bit further, and you'll find me. Are you, are you, you going to do a Winnie the Pooh imitation? Uh, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm under contract to not do it. <laughs> well, we've known each other since I was just a little kid. I think it would have been probably the mid-70s I would have met you at one of the I... old Winnipeg Aquarium. Wasn't that the Free Press building or something? Oh, God, I think we're going, we go back close to 40 years. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. I know you were a tyke. But even back then, you were a legend then. And here we are only a couple of years later, and your unbridled enthusiasm for fish keeping and everything about oh. fish and sharing knowledge hasn't changed whatsoever. Well, thanks. I look on that as a positive. Uh, sometimes people tell me that I'm being held captive for life in something that maybe I should consider not well, staying get in. Into that. <laughs> but it is, uh, it is a, a lifelong pursuit, and uh, I wouldn't change it for the world. So let's, let's tell, I'll give you a few minutes. Let's talk, tell the viewers a bit about you, your background, how you got into fish, maybe what your first fish is. There's got to be a story behind that. Oh, there are so many stories. I don't know where to begin. Um, actually, uh, I'm presently 74. I uh, was born in 1944. Uh, the first fish entered my life in 1950 when I was six years old. I remember seeing uh, an advertisement in a store nearby where I lived that somebody was selling fish out of their home. And being six years old, I didn't feel that maybe I was uh, independent enough to do this sort of thing, but um, unknown to my parents, I headed down to the address that they were <laughs> being sold at. That's something you'd and, totally encourage a six-year-old to do today. Yes, and I had a, a, a quarter in my sweaty little hand, and I remember sitting on the front step of the place for at least an hour, uh, nobody was home, but eventually a young boy came home and he took me inside and showed me a tank on the floor that contained some very nice red wag platies. I didn't know that that's what they were at the time, but he told me. So I handed him my sweaty 25 cent piece and he gave me one gravid female to take home. Uh, I was thinking ahead, I had a pickle jar at home, I had some bird gravel from my budgie cage <laughs> and a sprig of myriophyllum I believe that uh, my dad had picked up somewhere, I don't know where he got it, and that was where I put my fish. And I remember the next morning I saw fry up in the myriophyllum and I thought, this is really neat. Not knowing that that was the hook that probably caught me now for 65 years in this hobby. It's amazing how innocuous a start it was, but here I am, still doing it. So I, I'm, yes, I'm captive for life. Have you kept live bears since then? I've had live bears off and on. I'm, I'm quite conservation conscious, and I know that many live bears, especially in Mexico, are now highly at risk. And uh, some of the um, live bears that have come through the club, through the Aquarium Society in, in Winnipeg, uh, are ones that are on the CARES list as endangered species, so I have tried those for a, a time. Um, I can't say that I was entirely successful with them, uh, but I enjoyed having them while I had them. And that's a nice thing about, I guess, my view of the hobby. Um, it wouldn't matter what the fish is. There's an enjoyable factor to it, and uh, uh, it doesn't have to be a cichlid, it doesn't have to be a killie. Uh, there are times when I wish I could become a generalist hobbyist again and, and keep a tank of barbs and tetras, uh, you know, these are all thoughts. That go so you're through. saying there's a, there's a good chance that y your wife Tia is going to take that top tank and it'll be all glowfish. Well, not glowfish, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> last November I was in Australia and I spent a week collecting uh, rainbow fish in uh, the northern part, the northeastern part of uh, 
of Australia, and I got very fired up on rainbow fish. Uh, and I could see that tank having uh, many different species of rainbows in there. That would be a, something to shoot for. Yeah. But uh, whether that's going to happen, um, can't tell you for sure. <laughs> now, the years that I've known you, you've kept a, a large group of diverse type of fish. You know, but you've always had mainly primary interest in big Central American cichlids. I think you've pretty much done most of them. And then you went strongly into South American cichlids, where you went in a kind of a phase where you went into like discus and angels in a big way. Yes, yes. Why? Well, I think uh, you, you, you noticed that the tone of my voice kind of went downhill there a bit. Um, in the early 80s, I had a chance to travel to Mexico and Central America quite a bit. I would often go there a couple of times a year. My wife was very much interested in escaping from our cold blast of winter, so we would spend time down there. And those were much gentler times, uh, much different from now, where you could actually go out into the boonies and you could find some cichlids in southern Yucatan. Safely. <laughs> safely, uh, not risking life and limb. Uh, and uh, I did. I brought back many different species, no questions asked, uh, from southern Mexico, Laguna Bacalar, from the Belize border. Um, I had some of the first Europhthalmus, I think, in North America. Uh, some people, I think, have blamed me for the uh, fact that they're <laughs> running rampant in Florida right now because I brought them back to North America in 1980 and nobody had even heard of them then. So I'm, I'm not saying I'm responsible for all that stuff going on down there, but it's uh, kind of an odd coincidence. <laughs> Uh, but no, I, br I would bring fish back from Mexico and, uh, and enjoy them in my tanks and it really added a whole new dimension to the hobby. I mean, it's one thing to go to a store and get a fish and say, you know, this is what I got, I'm going to read up about it. Well, when you catch a foot-long uh, Maya Heros Europhthalmus on hook and line, and you pull it in and it's a breeding male because you can see his, Full color, his, yeah. his, <laughs> his, uh, his fry following him in as I reeled him in. I mean, that's a heart beating, heart thumping experience. And uh, I experienced all that. It was, it was really great in the 80s. Um, I did go to Cuba and uh, as the US people know, uh, Cuba was out of bounds to any Americans, but the Canadians, Germans, etc., were allowed in there and uh, I fished, I brought back the uh, pardon me, uh, Tetracanthus, uh, some really nice live bearers, Gerardinus metallicus, and it was not easy to get them out, but I was young and more foolish than I am right now, uh, and um, so I put them in bags and shoved them into my dirty laundry, and uh, <laughs> when I was coming through Cuban customs, they were going through everything in my bags, and I figured this is it. I'm probably not going to be getting on the plane. We'll have another video of smuggling <laughs> tips with Jim. <laughs> I've, I've got a few. Uh, a, a, lucky, a lucky outcome. Um, I had put them in my dirty laundry bag, and when the uh, customs agent said, uh, what, what's in here, I, I just held my nose and said, uh, phew, you don't want to go in there. And he said, you're right, I don't want to go in there. <laughs> and, and that's where my fish were, and I did get them out successfully. Now, I'm not saying to do this regularly or break the law, but you know, desperate young people often do silly things and that was yeah. one of my magic moments. Okay. So, uh, Something must have definitely gotten out of hand because I remember a pretty dark phase where uh, your bride Tia kind of relegated your hobby, no longer in the basement, no longer fish room. You had a fish room that was the end of the hall in your linen closet. So I don't think you kept a lot of cichlids in that phase. <clears throat> no, there was a, a period of time when we lived in the country we just wanted to get a nice taste of country living, much like Chris is doing right now with his, uh, his farm. Uh, we lived in the country and the water supply was terrible. And so the concept of having um, a fish room where you could do water changes just didn't exist. So I literally had to carry my water in from the city in five gallon camping tote jugs. And that's the way I did my water changes. And I also realized that I couldn't have big tanks because I'd be doing this 24 hours a day and RO um, units weren't really prevalent. You know, they would be well, massive whole house systems that were well, cost right. prohibitive. So I decided, Achilles, that's the only way I can go here. So I had in a closet, as Chris mentioned, a closet that was about 10 feet by 6 feet high by 2 feet, 3 feet deep. And I lined it with shelves, and in that little space I managed to get close to 80 aquariums. Uh, they were all 1s and 2s and 5 gallons at the most, but that was the way I kept my hobby alive. What year was this? That would be 1987. To and nine, you to still 19. have all those tanks in your garage, right? Those tanks are still <laughs> all there, carefully nested away. 
at some point, maybe to be resurrected. In, I've never understood as we word. get older, all of a sudden, most people, as they get older, they start going into, your eyes are failing, your ears are failing. We start going into smaller fish. You're doing it the right way. Bigger fish. Well, That's the way yeah, I am. At least now fish. I can see them. I, I have looked at Killies <laughs> lately, and my... my um, Use of a magnifying glass is most appreciated at that point now. But uh, no, I, I kept Killies back then, and the, the upside was that it kept me in the hobby. And another upside is that I had ditches out there that were absolutely filled with live food, mosquito larvae, uh, fairy shrimp, you name it. So those Killies never had it so good. Wives love it when you bring fresh mosquito larvae into all your tanks. Oh, yes. And the fish don't eat it at all. And they that, that is just bliss. Yes, yes. And... <laughs> then we have mosquitoes in the house. Yes, this is true. This is the way it goes. Well, it's really good to see that you've overcome the oppression of your hobby, so that's good. You know, once again, you're full bore. You well, got a fair-sized fish room I'm as, now. I'm as full bore as I can get. When yeah. my wife and I moved into this house, though, uh, we had an agreement that I couldn't go beyond a certain point. Uh, that was the restriction line, the do not cross line. It was a piece of masking tape on the floor. <laughs> And <laughs> we agreed that this is, this is the limit to which I could expand. So I've had to be very creative over the years. And uh, most of my additions to the fish room have been vertical uh, in a room that is only seven feet something high. Uh, to stack three tanks high is quite a challenge. And one thing you'll notice in the fish room, you'll never see a sump because sumps occupy spaces that tanks would take. And that's what goes in that space. So yeah. no, no sumps in my fish room. Nobody's going to be watching this, Jim. This is just you and me. I know. Uh, yeah, How I'm many not... times has that piece of tape moved? Uh, the tape is worn out, but my wife continually reminds me where it was. Oh? oh all right. no, not that I challenge it. Don't get me wrong. I don't challenge that. I, oh. I, I agree with her that there has to be a limit. Well, I understand that all part of maintaining harmony within the family home. I've oh, yes. learned, or at least I very try to grasp that concept, the basic old adage of happy wife, happy life. And, uh, uh, it, uh, it, nobody should know that better than you. No, but I must admit, my wife is very supportive of my hobby. She... Uh, uh, loves what I do. If uh, it be the speaking now or any writing article, she's she's quite happy. She's happy to see that I'm I'm fully engaged in something that I truly. She's quite love. happy to go on trips with you. Yeah, and, and this is it too. <laughs> if, if it turns out that she can accompany me on a trip, it, it it's an added bonus. Yeah. I uh, I find that traveling alone is sometimes um, a little bit empty uh, of a, an experience, but when you have your your spouse along, it can make a bit of a difference. Yep. Uh, that, you know, well, I travel a lot too, not only for my job, but also for fun and stuff like this. And uh, Tia, like my wife Dana, you know, they're they're left with the responsibility when we go away. And uh, I know Tia's not the, the, the most loving of fish and stuff like that, but uh, does she have a favorite fish? Well, um, I had just, when I went to Europe a few weeks back, I was away for three weeks. And my son was going on a trip to Cancun, so he wasn't able to look after them, and he's usually my go-to guy. But Tia offered to do this. Well, actually, I asked her, and she said, "Yes, I will do it." Um, <laughs> she was like way down on the list. <laughs> I had just, I had just retrieved the spawn of Therichthys passionis, a, a beautiful um, firemouth-like cichlid, yellow, gold. Uh, I had just pulled some young out, and they were minuscule. I, I put them in a breeder box, and I said to her. Can you look after these babies? Um, I've got some brine shrimp frozen. Could you put a piece in, watch them carefully to see if they're not overeating, and just like, you know, monitor them closely. Look on them as very special. See, you've already gone beyond what your normal expectations oh my God. should be. <laughs> well, this was it. I mean, not only just the feeding, but uh, to look after this special little uh, bunch of fry. Well, they all survived. Uh, in fact, I invited her down the other day to see the results of her efforts. They're now like half an inch long and they're looking like their parents a little bit more every day and I'm really happy with the way it all worked out and uh, I guess her greatest fear is that now she might be asked uh, more often. <laughs> well, you were, she was also sending you videos of the tuba with their fry. And... Well, that's it. Now having, having FaceTime and having an iPad uh, it makes all the difference now because I can actually monitor the tanks no matter where I am. Um, so she's willing to walk around. <laughs> and she just she just walks around with her iPad and shows me the tank if there's an issue with it or if the water's getting a bit low or if a, a power head hasn't started up. Uh, I can spot this and then I can you know uh, react accordingly. So it's made a big difference. So she can walk around with it. Basically, I'd picture it if it were me at my house. Is I'd tell my wife we're FaceTiming. She's going to walk around with the iPad. She's going to point at a tank and I say, "Oh, that tank's in trouble." Uh, it needs a water change. And I can just see her saying, well, I guess they're going to die. And then she just <laughs> move along. <laughs> well, 
Uh, this time, for a three-week trip away, I had fewer losses than I have really ever had before, which is really uh, kudos to, to my wife and, and son. They did a, re a great job. And without their help, I, I just couldn't do what I do. Um, going away like that is very hard on the fish, fish room. Uh, but uh, I've got this, you know, positive outcome, which is great. <laughs> well, you've come, looks like you've come completely full circle. We're back where you need you to be. We got back big and big cichlids, big aquariums. How many aquariums do you have in total that are actually up and running? What would be say? What would you say the volume of water in here? Oh gosh, you know what? I'm, I'm, I've really never totaled it up recently. Uh, We're I in thousands, though. In terms yeah. of in terms of aquariums, I usually run between 35 and 50. Uh, what I've been trying to do is reduce my number of small tanks um, yeah. and in, increase the larger tanks. Uh, they're more stable. They're easier to maintain. The only thing is it curtails my breeding of fish, which is the main interest that I have in this hobby, breeding and looking at social interaction, that type of thing. Um, but um, I would say 50 would be my maximum that I've had set up. I've got 10 or 11 180s, that's about as big a tank as I can manage. Uh, I would go bigger, but there's no space for it in my limited space. And uh, secondly, I'd have to literally build it on site, so it wouldn't work out that yeah, well. Yeah, it's about the biggest me. tank you can physically get into the house that's, and downstairs that's and move around. Yeah. So, I mean, given another place, another place to set up, I'd love to have a tank like the one you're proposing or yeah. the one that you had formerly, that 750 yeah. gallon. This, this is my go my dream. That's place. the fall. We're going to start that again. But yeah. I ordered a couple of, uh, I have these two new, they're both the same shape as those ones that Spencer recently got for that whole wing. Mm -hmm. I think they're, they're the same footprint as a 180. But they're not quite as tall. I think they're 20, 20 tall instead of 24. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and the guy made them out of heavy, like half inch or whatever glass. Mm. I've built 180 out of plywood. Mm -hmm. I can move those tanks around, get it up on the top of the stand by myself. Yeah, Maybe not yeah. as easy as I am as we're getting older, but no problem. Those 160s, I had to have a team over to be able to oh, lift exactly. that one onto the top of the stand. Like, yeah. glass tanks are so heavy. So the fact that how many you have in your basement here is, well, is once, a credit to you. Once they're in place, <laughs> let's just say they don't get moved very often. Like, never. <laughs> uh, I remember waiting four months until I happened to have the right number of people with the right degree of cooperation over here before I could lift the 150 tank onto a stand uh, four feet high. Uh, and I made sure they never left the house until that was done. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, you have to pick your moments, and uh, I know what I can handle. And big, big, big tanks are kind of beyond me now. Yeah. Now, I've noticed over the years, I don't think I've ever seen a Riff Lake cichlid that you've ever kept. Is that true? Well, yes, that would be before you. Okay. Because you're a young guy. Yeah. Um, in 1971. I, I would have been did try <laughs> to keep a tank of Mbuna, uh, Malawi cichlids, going. Uh, it was at that time that many of them were being imported for the first time, and uh, of course I was always interested in anything new, and they certainly looked exciting, they had a lot of bling, and uh, the new kids on the block. They were right? so, always all male or all female? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've, I've learned a lot over the last few years that uh, the Rift Lake cichlids will never enter my home again for reasons that I won't go into. Um, I actually explained that at a meeting once and somebody was ready to throw a shoe at me and I decided well, it's discretion just not your was the better part of valor. Yeah. Yeah. No, I have my reasons and uh, one is that I don't know when to quit and there are just too many available so I would get overwhelmed with them. Yeah. That's the truth of the yeah. matter. Uh, but I did have them. I had them in a 70 gallon tank, a nice colony of them. And it just so happened, I did have the tank upstairs and the floor must have sagged a bit and the tank cracked and uh, unknown to me leaked out overnight and yeah. I, I lost the whole works. Okay. And past that point, I've not had an African cichlid except uh, Madagascans, which are truly African, and one from West Africa, the Heterochromus multidens, which is very Madagascan-like. Yeah, very and unique very species. very South yeah. American-like too, so yeah. I made an exception. Now I have had West African riverine cichlids before. Uh, the uh, pel pelvic acromus complex uh, yep. and I really did enjoy yeah. the crib types and they were wonderful too and I could definitely go back into them. Oh okay. Yeah. They'd be kind of, you know, they wouldn't need the big big tanks. They, they will never make it in this particular <laughs> setting and I don't foresee any change in what I've got back there right now other than to to uh, perhaps get rid of all of the fish that I just can't bear to get rid of. <laughs> that, that's one of my fatal flaws. Once I get a fish I have it for life, my life or their life.
You also have that one unique, uh, it comes from extremely high temperature. Like oh, the, the Danakilia uh, yeah, species, yeah. Sure, yeah, from Eritrea. Eritrea. Now, I don't keep it at the 92 or whatever they recommend for it, and they're doing quite fine. Um, I got that because I was intrigued by the fact that that fish lived in such high saline conditions, and um, unfortunately, I think I have two, three females. I don't have a male, so. Oh. <laughs> anyway, but they're there, they're doing well, and uh, mixing in, I must admit, I don't have them in a species-only tank. I have, in many cases, mixed my fish because I just don't have enough room. I've got to pair the group down, and then I have a better situation. But that brings me to my next point. You've always maintained your tanks in that way, so maybe you can explain your philosophy for success in managing your big aquariums and your diverse collection of fish, because you don't, a lot of people, the big breeders are the big rough fish. They always used to keep them in a bear tank divider, and that's just not, doesn't make aesthetically pleasing. You do these large community tanks, but that takes a lot of due diligence and work to make sure that the pairs and it does. works. It does. Um, I went that route of having pairs in a divided tank. When I was keeping Central American fish back in the 80s, very seriously, uh, that's the way I kept them. They were in pairs, they were a partial divider where uh, the female was small enough that she could go through certain openings in the divider, but the male was yeah. too large to get through. And um, I kept them fairly successfully that way. But as you say, aesthetically, it's like the worst situation possible. Yeah. This is not natural or whatsoever. how you can appreciate and enjoy your aquarium but by looking at that The way. option was pull the divider and you lose your female, or in some cases, even the male. Yeah. They will simply aggress on one another. Uh, males tend to be very impatient when the female is not ready to spawn and can take it out on her, and within minutes she has descaled and defend and de-eyed. And uh, <laughs> therefore, you've lost your only female that you're ever going to come by. Uh, I remember this happened with a, a pair of Amphilopus trimaculatus that I had brought back from from uh, southern Mexico in near Acapulco, and this beautiful pair developed. I just loved them, and they were in a tank with a glass divider that had one corner cut out, big enough for her to get through. And she would come and go, and she knew the escape route. Uh, well, one day I came home from work, and she mustn't have been able to get to the escape route, and yeah, I found her enough. just mush totally stripped of everything. And it was heartbreaking. And from that point on, I decided community tanks are the way to go. Uh, and I've had really good success with them. I find that the presence of the other fish uh, <clears throat> result in pair bonds when they're forming to be much stronger because it pulls the pair together against those other um, competitors. Yeah. And it also prompts <clears throat> the uh, pair bonding to increase in strength, but also then the chance of a spawn occurring. Now, I don't normally have my tanks so heavily um, stocked that there isn't an opportunity to spawn simply because it's too busy. Uh, there's usually some corner where a pair can, can go and can actually have a spawn. And it's amazing how the pair can look after those young in the presence of those other fish. And there's almost an understanding that the other fish, they stay clear. Uh, there wouldn't be any fish in there that would be foolish enough to go into the pair's area because they know what the outcome would be. So it's almost like they all know what to do, and the amount of uh, uh, problems are very minimal with that. Well, you're and always very active on your, your social media pages, your Facebook pages. You're very, very, you, you, you're, you spend so much time in your fish room that you actually watch your fish and find the behaviors of your fish. Well, you know, I do. Unique and behaviors. In, 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 I, I wish, I, I think if you don't look at your fish, you, you miss so much. I mean, I don't know why you keep them. <laughs> well, that's what I wonder too. Now, I kind of have that issue forced on me. I made the mistake in this house of not putting a water change system into place when I first mm -hmm. moved in. Uh, I got all excited about wanting to obtain some fish uh, that I had never had a chance before. Uh, Aficionados, the local wholesaler uh, owned by Spencer Jack. Uh, made it too tempting for me to buy fish without being prepared. So I basically filled my basement. It was like uncontrolled cell division. The tanks were simply going where there was a spot for them with no rhyme or reason. Uh, the price to pay, I do have to do my water changes in a more tedious way. Uh, it's not all bucket and siphon, but um, it's sort of like that. And. Uh, but old school but, fish keeping like that makes that force but, attention on But them. I'm always at my tanks. Yeah. Uh, I am always looking at them. When I'm doing a water change, I don't just leave the room and let it happen. I'm usually walking around and waiting for the siphon to finish doing its thing. 
and uh, I notice things. And I usually have my camera at the ready so that if I see something of interest, I'll get a, either a snapshot or a, a short video of it. And uh, I love that. Um, like I'm so totally taken by the behavior of these incredible creatures. They, people could learn a lot from watching their fish in terms of how to parent and how to deal with other uh, confrontational situations. Uh, I, I know my wife says I'm growing gills and so on right now. But um, well, What's the title of your YouTube channel? How do people find you on YouTube? My, tube, my YouTube channel is strictly Jim Cumming or if you do a search on 2000 Notho, you'll find me, 2000 Notho, and that's my reference to my Killy days, not yeah. the Branchius. Uh, as I say, if you do a search on Jim Cumming and you put in the name of a cichlid, you'll get me instead of the voice actor for Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> uh, but I'm there. I am there somewhere. If you and you have what seven hundred some odd videos I've on there. I've got seven hundred yeah. odd videos on there, and they're all basically um, breeding behaviors. Uh, over the years, I've had so many opportunities to share my hobby, and without the social media, it was difficult to do that. And I found YouTube was a great vehicle for doing that. And now I depend more on Facebook actually than YouTube right now, but uh, either way, um, at least I'm letting people see what I do, and I'm not doing it to blow my own horn, I'm just trying to share my experiences with people and maybe give them some, some direction in their, in their fish keeping. That's basically what it's all about. I, I was a teacher all my life, I, I taught physics and chemistry and math for 42 years, and uh, I guess it's a teacher coming out in me. I just have to inform people yep. about this great hobby and share and that passion with them. Yep. The passion is yep. there. And, uh, well, maybe if we can, if you're if you're welcome to it, we'll come back in the summer and we'll touch base. We'll do a second video on your other passion, which is my car. No, yep. well, we can do a video on his car too. Everybody like a video on his car. No. But where do these guys go for summer vacation? Oh, my pond! Oh yes. my gosh! Yes, I'm revamping my pond. I had to put in a new liner this year. I just picked it up yesterday, and uh, my wife will be putting the liner in. She's really good at tucking and <laughs> nailing and stapling, and she's contributing to my pond. And uh, yeah, I'm getting getting some of the fish ready for summer camp. That's what I call it for them. And um, I've selected mostly Central Americans this year. Uh, last year it was South American fish, and they do so well out there. They really do. It's like the prison yard. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And I'm the prison keeper, but they love me. They're jumping out of the water, saying hi all the time. And, uh, well, that's wonderful, Jim. Thank you very, very much. My pleasure. If you guys have any other questions for Jim, you could probably post some comments down here and send some questions because Jim will see the video. It's going to be linked to his page as well. So any questions you got for me, I can't imagine why, but questions you want to know about this guy, about any of the fish he keeps. Just put them in the comments there and we'll get you the answers.